God. Uh, sometimes we don't understand or know the characteristics of God, and sometimes that will alter our behavior. When you don't know how God is in a certain situation or in certain circumstances or what his character is, it will cause you sometimes to make decisions that are contrary to the Bible. Uh, for example, if, if you think that, um, that God is merciful without, without his justice, what will happen is, is that you'll just keep on doing some of the things you're doing to say, well, God's merciful, so he's going you know, to forgive me and he's going to without understanding that God is also just. Amen. Amen. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. I thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Father, we don't take that for granted. Lord, we know everyone works and has a hard day, Father, and many are tired and many, you know, sometimes just a feeling under the weather, whatever it may be, Father, but they still came tonight. And I ask you to reward their obedience, Father, to come and hear your word because I know, Lord, they didn't come to hear me because, Lord, it's not me, it's you. And I pray, Father, that you will speak to me, speak through me, speak to them, and that they will take your word, not my word, but your word, which is everlasting. You said the, the sun fadeth, the flower fadeth, um, the grass fadeth rather, the sun fadeth, but your word will remain forever. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you tonight. And I pray that you would bless your people and reward them, Father. Because you said you're a reward of them that diligently seek you. And that's not just in prayer, but that's in giving up of their time and efforts and all the things that they would rather be doing or could do. And they have decided that this is one of the most important things in their life. And so they come. And I ask your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight we're going to talk about the attributes of God and the meaning of the word attributes and what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us so as A.W. Tower in his classic book The Attributes of God and it's also uh, one of his other books called The Knowledge of the Holy uh, two books I recommend that you get into your library I'll repeat them again to you it's uh, by A.W. Towser it's The Knowledge of the Holy and the other one is The Attributes of God. Uh, I'm sorry, it's The Attributes of God, which is the knowledge of the holy. It's not two books, it's one. So why would we, he says, why would he make such an extreme pronouncement? Okay. Toza goes on to say, man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than the, its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. In other words, how you worship and how you look at God is going to be reflective about how you're going to um, live your life. In other words, um, you can come in here and, and, and worship God and raise your hands and do all those outward exter you know, external things, but if you're not living right in your private life, God doesn't receive that. That's something totally different. Uh, because he says, who will worship God? Who will go into the way of the holy hill of God? Those that have what? Clean hands and a what? And a pure heart. So we can, you know, like he says in the Romans, you know, that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what is that perfect will of God. And that you give yourself over as a living sacrifice or a living worship. That's what your life is. So... Your life should be worshipped. So no matter where you go, no matter what you do, if you always keep it in the back of your mind that God is watching you, not so much to punish you, but God is, is watching you so that you will be called of God to show forth who God is. I think the reason why a lot of people in churches today and a lot of people in the, in the world today are really looking for, for, for the answers in life is because they're not seeing it in church people. Hello? Hello? I can hear the crickets. I think when they look at some Christians' lives and they say, they're not any different than people in the world. They're doing the same things as people in the world are doing, and there's no difference. And I think rather than trying to accommodate the gospel, okay, we need to be reflecting the gospel in our life. We need to be reflecting what is the true meaning to be a Christian. And if we do that, then I think that will be the drawing factor to God, uh, for people to be drawn to God. It won't be us. It'll be 
God living his life through us, and they'll be attracted to that. And so they want to they want to know about this Jesus that's in your life. It's not so much sometimes how, how much we talk to people, uh, how much we, we say to people, but it's how we live. And if they see how we live, if they see that in the midst of trials and tribulations, in the midst of, of um, you know, going through some hard, tough times in life, that we're not cussing, we're not swearing, we're not slamming things, we're not throwing things up against the wall, you know, we're not complaining, moaning, and groaning. When they see those things and we see how they handle it, and I believe all of those things have, have a real effect on our understanding of God's purposes and God's sovereignty. We'll be talking one, about one of those things in a few moments. So in our hearts, we know what I said is true. It's not enough to follow God. That, and that word uh, has come to mean so many different things today that it actually means very little to people. When you say the word generic God, you say that word God, Different things flash into di different people's minds. They think they can think of Roman Catholicism. They can think of statues. They can think of uh, Buddha. They can think of uh, so many uh, different religions. So the word God doesn't really have its effect that it did, say, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. When you mention God, people knew it was Jesus Christ. Today, it means just about everything. You know, if you, if you talk to people that are unsaved, please don't ask them to pray for you. Okay? They have no direct connection to God. Jesus said, you cannot come to me except through the Father. So, you, you know, you can't go to the Father, rather, except you come through me. So, if they're not saved, okay, if they're not saved, they can't have access to God. Only God's children have access to God. So somebody can say they're religious and they go to church and, you know, they can even sing in choirs, they can even teach Sunday school lessons, they can do all of those things. But if they're not born again, if there has not been a regeneration, not a reformation, I talked about that a couple of Sundays ago, right? Not, not uh, reformation, but regeneration. Unless you've been regenerated, you don't have access with the Father. I don't care how much you think you're praying or how much... You know, you pray. If, if you're not living right, sin separates you from God. We know that from the Word. So if we have unconfessed sin in our life, uh, if we think that God is just there to forgive us every time we do something wrong, uh, to just keep on doing what we're doing, then are we really asking for forgiveness? Because I think it goes with the understanding that we don't understand who God is. We don't have a full concept of what his attributes are. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And we're going to talk about the basic attributes of God. You know, the Bible says Jesus came to reveal the God of the Bible, right? How much do you hold this book in esteem? How, how high do you value this word? Is it just something that you, you want to get information out of so that you can uh, impress your friends with the knowledge you have of the Bible because most people don't have very little knowledge uh, of the Bible, but when you speak the Word of God, what is the purpose behind it? And God's Word is God's Word. Amen? And this Word is just as authoritative as the voice of God speaking down from heaven. If you look at many times Jesus quoted, he said, hasn't it been said in the Scriptures? Paul did it, Peter did it, the disciples did it. They referred back to the scriptures. So if they're saying that the scriptures have, have the words of life in them, even John, uh, is it in 1 John, he says, these things were written, written. These things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. I said that to a, Mormon, uh, to a Mormon one time. I'm sorry, not to a Mormon, to a Mooney. And she asked me, she says, do you know if you're going to heaven? I says, absolutely I do. She says, well, where are you going? I said, I'm definitely going to heaven. And, and tears came in her eyes. She says, I didn't think it was possible for anybody to know that. I says, absolutely. I says, if you read God's word, God's word says that these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. And that eternal life and that this life is in his son. You have eternal life in Christ. And that's all that matters. That's all you need to know as far as that's concerned. Praise God. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to be taking these characteristics from Taos' book, The Knowledge of the Holy, 
I think I do have that book. I don't know if I have it here or if I have it home. But uh, it's a great book. If you, I've read it before. And, and there's 18 characteristics of God in the Bible. And they, they're going to be repeated as, as, I, as I share them with you. I think you'll be blessed. And the Bible very expressly says to praise God for who he is. Now, do you praise God just for what he does? Yeah. Oh, God, thank you for getting me out of this difficulty. Oh, God, thank you for helping me pass this test. Oh, God, thank you for helping me remember this. Oh, God, thank you for keeping me safe. God, that car almost hit me. Thank you, God. For... Those things are good to do, but are you, th are you just praising God for who he is? And let me ask you a question. If God was to do nothing more for you than what he's done already, would you still worship him? Amen. Would you still acknowledge him if he didn't answer any more of your prayers? Well, be careful. You, you know, you're all shaking your head, but you know, there might come a trial <laughs> that comes your way. I believe God does those things. He allows those things to happen to us and go, for us to go through things so that we will say, you know what, Lord? In the good times, in the bad times, in the difficult times, I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to praise you. It's a matter of the will. And it's a matter of putting self aside in knowing who God is and who the God you're worshiping. Let me ask you something. When you, before you come to God in prayer, do you worship him first? <laughs> Most of us probably don't. Okay. Um, I, I posted something on Facebook. I don't know if some of you saw it about um, it's a... I think it's called We Glorify Him or something like that. It's an instrumental. And I just put it there and I said, just take a few minutes to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Enjoy. You'd be surprised just listening to music begins to cause you to praise Him. Even if it's instrumental. And I prefer instrumental than having voices because voices are a distraction. But if you just put on something with an instrumental and just go and worship God, before you pray. Well, the Bible says to enter his courts with thanksgiving. I'm sorry, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. So thanksgiving and praise, okay, and then to go into the holy of holies, uh, or to go right into the presence of God, you have, to, you, have to, you have to do those two protocols first. You've got to enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, and then go into the Holy of Holies. Some people just bust the door right down, go right through to go running right, right past the outer court, right into the Holy of Holies, and think, okay, God, I'm here. I'm going to praise you. Thank you, Jesus, and so forth and so on. Start telling God all the things that you need and all the things that's going on in your life and all the cares and all the supplications and the prayers and, and intercessors. And all those things are good, but I think sometimes when we do that out of order, God just, just shakes his head, you know, <laughs> just says, you know, you need to respect God, who he is. Yes, he's your friend. God is a, I'm a friend of God. Yeah, you're a friend and, you know, and he, Jesus is your brother and all this good stuff. But understand that God is still holy. God is still who he is. And, and that he goes far beyond and greater than our own ability to understand in the fullness of our finite minds, you know, that we have a limited minds that we have, that um, God is far greater than even what we could think. If you had the highest, loftiest thoughts of God, even that would come short of who he is. Think about it. It's, it's amazing if you start to stop and think. Uh, another book that I, re I recommend is The Attributes of God by uh, Stephen Chanek. It's about 30 bucks, I think, something like that. It's a two-volume set. I mean, you read that stuff. I, I think, Brother Tom, you read that, right? It, it, you, you can't just read it. <laughs> it's heavy stuff. I mean, you have to sit there and, and, and soak it in and read it again, and, and you just get a, a greater understanding. But to just sit back and, and I, just, I just marvel, and we, we all do it, but we just sit back and we don't really put our effort into studying. We don't put our effort into the things that we need to do to really understand to the best that we can, okay, who God is. 
And you know what it says in the Bible? It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, God does not want us to throw our reason in the garbage. God doesn't want us to throw our brains in the garbage. No, not at all. We don't worship some, some uh, fairy tale God up in the sky without any f historical fact. That's not true. This historical fact that Jesus Christ came, who he, said, who he said he was, he was, what he did, apart from the biblical resources, there's other outside historical forces that, resources that says that Jesus came and died, and rose again, there's biblical witnesses. So we have all kinds of evidence. What we need to do is study the word and study what the word of God says about God so we can know God. We can know what he's like. You know, if, if you want to know what, it, what he's like, you've got to read the word. You've got to study the word. Not just read it, but study it. Because a lot of times we get a, a wrong concept with just a quick glance at it. If you look at the book of Psalms, you can see it's all loaded with worship. Worship and praise and, and, and testimony of God's goodness and greatness. So we're going to talk about the characteristics of God, the attributes of God, so we get a better understanding of God and what he's like. Now, I, I can tell you from my personal experience of 30 years plus of being a Christian, I think if you could take a grain of, of a little granite of sand from a beach, that's about as much as I know in my 30 years. Um, if you, if you, <laughs> even when you compare people with PhDs and doctorates and so forth, they'll tell you the more you come to know is you've come to the realization of the less you know. And it's so funny because some people think they know, but they don't. Um, they think they have all the facts and all of that stuff, but they don't. And it's sad because when a person thinks they are something, the Bible says, and they're not, they deceive themselves. Well, let's go with the characteristic of God's wisdom. Let's go with God's wisdom. Wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve these ends by the most perfect means. I'll say that again. If we want to... If we wanna come to God and ask God for wisdom, then we have to obtain that wisdom in the right way. We can't go to God with preconceived ideas to our questions about situations in our life already determined with the answer. Because what happens with that is you begin to hear a voice, but it won't be God's voice. Okay? It'll be your voice or it'll be the enemy's voice to convince you to do what you want. So in other words, if, and to be honest and to be open with God is to have, a, have an ear open with no preconceived ideas about what you're asking him. You know, okay, God, I'm coming to you. I want to lift up this girl to you that I'm going to marry. Okay. You know I love her, but Lord, your will be done. But we already ordered the cake. We already ordered the invitations. We already got the hall rented. We already got the church rented. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> we already go to God with preconceived ideas already, saying, okay, God, I got all this done, so, you know, now give me your wisdom. No, God's going to say no. He's not even going to talk to you. Okay, but when you go to God and you say, God, I'm open. God, I haven't made any decisions. I haven't made any decisions in my mind. I, I don't know what, I, what to do. Like we talked about with Jehoshaphat, remember he said, I don't know what to do, Lord, but my eyes are fixed on thee. I don't know what to do. He fell down and worshiped God. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do, but God, I'm going to worship you because I want what you want. And if you go with that kind of attitude of heart, God will speak to you. And I want to encourage you to start listening to God. God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak to your spirit in a still small voice. Don't be waiting for this big megaphone voice, you know which is so funny because I, I kind of played a trick on somebody the other day. I took them to the doctors. And uh, uh, they came out of the anesthesia, and, uh, and they were kind of like groggy a little bit. So I played a little joke on them. I went, this is the Lord thy God. I want you to worship me with all of your heart. 
And the person started, I love you, Jesus. Is that you, Lord? And started singing, I love you, Jesus. I love you. <laughs> it was really, it was funny. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help myself. Uh, I, I just thought that was so, so awesome, you know, to get that opportunity. <laughs> but wisdom is the ability to devise perfect ends to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. In other words, God makes no mistakes. He is the Father who truly knows best. As Paul explained in 11, uh, Romans 11.33, he said, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. It, it, his ways are higher than our ways. But his ways are the best ways. But God wants us to know his will. Okay. And it's very interesting. I think it's in Psalm 86. I think it's in Psalm 86. I'm not sure. But it says that he showed Moses his ways, his acts to the children of Israel. See, children of Israel were sign seekers. Give us a sign. Show us, show us your power. Give us your sign. But Moses was one to know his ways. And when you, get to, when you, when you have a heart that wants to know God's ways, the power and the, the miracles and everything comes along with it. But what happened was, when they didn't know God's ways, and they didn't see the miracles, what are they saying? Kill Moses! Kill Moses! You know, they wanted to stone Moses because, you know, you're making us work twice as hard now, Moses. You know, they started coming against him. Because they didn't realize, they didn't know God's ways. They didn't understand God's ways. Sometimes God doesn't have to, listen to me, sometimes God doesn't have to tell you why. God doesn't owe you an explanation. If God says no, when God says no to you, what do you do? Do you pout? Um, all right, Lord, but I don't like it. Do you pout? Or do you go to God and say, God, I really feel like you're saying no to this, but I know that you have every good intention for me. I know that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. I know, Lord, that you have the best intentions for me. And so by telling me no, I trust you. Because you know the, the beginning, the middle, and the end all at the same time, and I'm only looking at it from this perspective. So God, if you're telling me no, that's, that's okay with me. That's fine with me. I worship you and praise you anyway, and I thank you for answering me. That should be your heart's attitude. Not <laughs> So we need God's wisdom. It's the ability to take and devise the perfect end to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. That's what wisdom is. How do we get wisdom? Hmm? What did you say? Ask. Does God give wisdom? Okay. Who does he give it to? Hmm? I, you got to speak louder. How does he... If we ask... But how does he give it to us? Through his word? Okay. Does he give it to everybody? Okay, I have a yes if they ask. Anyone else? Huh? Those who are believers? Okay. There's a pre-qualifier to receiving wisdom. Anybody know what it is? Hmm? Mm -mm. Obedience? No. Humility? No. All good answers, though, by the way. Not the one I'm looking for. 
leaving? No. There's something, there's an ingredient. You know, you ever have something that somebody makes you something and you've had it before, but, you know, they've, they've, they invite you over for dinner sometime, you know, especially if they make like a coconut Indian shrimp, <coughs> you know, and, uh, you, you know, you, you love that thing. But if you went another time and they, and they made it for you, but they left in a certain ingredient out, it just didn't taste the same. Something's missing. Well, it's like that with wisdom. What do you think the one ingredient that's missing from a lot of Christians? Discernment? No. Good answer, though, but no. When I tell you, you're going to go, oh, should have had a V8. Okay. No. The one ingredient that's missing from people receiving wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you have the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. Because when you fear God, you don't want to take any of that wisdom and misapply it. You want God to show you, and you're not going to change it. You're not going to modify it to what you want. The fear of the Lord is the, beginning of, is the beginning of wisdom. That's what Proverbs says. Isn't that good? Amen. Hallelujah. How many need wisdom? I do. I need wisdom. Andy's got two hands up. <laughs> Me too. I'll put two hands up. I need, I need a lot of wisdom. And, and, you know, that's why in relationships, when you have a husband and wife relationship, a wife that will truly, yes? Oh. <laughs> um, I, I got off my, my, that's okay. I'll get back on. I'll get back on. Shh, 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 shh. My wife does that to me. Shh. When it comes to a, a husband and wife relationship, the reason why a lot of wives don't trust their husband's decisions is because they've made bad decisions and didn't use wisdom. And so the wife gets very shaky when it comes to decision making. Okay, because sometimes if there's, if there's a husband or a spouse or a wife or whatever that makes wrong, consistently makes wrong decisions, the wife has to pay for it too. Or the husband has to pay for it too. And so over a period of years, when a person is seeking the Lord and asking God for wisdom, and throughout their life, the wife begins to see the wisdom of God and the things that her husband's doing, there's more of a trust there, right? And so what happens is, is that it's a lot easier. Like a lot of people will look at Linda's and say, you know, you're, you're so submissive, and she is, that it's unusual for American women. It is. But she was, she was discipled by someone from another country that is submissive. And I believe that impartation went to her, okay, because she could be feisty. You know, when I first met her, she used to kick dashboards if she didn't get her way, Okay. And, and so God worked on her, and, and she saw the beauty. And, and one I, thing I love about my wife is she's a studier. Okay? She'll, she'll, she'll go, and she'll go off by herself and study the Bible. I don't have to tell her, go study your Bible. She does all that on her own. And she'll spend hours, just for the woman's fellowship. You'd be surprised, two or three days, eight hours a day, six hours a day, whatever. As much as she can put into it, she puts herself into that thing. Okay? Because she wants to make sure that she's given you what God has put upon her heart. When's the woman's thing? April 18th, don't forget, Friday night, Sister Esther uh, Arujo is going to be sharing. So my point is, yes, God gives wisdom to those who ask, but you've got to have the right perspective and the right aspect of God's character. You've got to fear the Lord. There's no fear, hardly any fear of the Lord in churches today. People are running around saying, this, God said this, God said that, and doing all kinds of crazy things. In the name of God, but it's not wisdom. Not wisdom at all. Then we have people on television telling you about wisdom, but it's stupid wisdom. Okay? Their wisdom is send $1,000. God will bless you. 
sow a seed, sow a seed. I'm so sick and tired of Christian television. That's all I, not all, but I mean, very few are preaching the word, the unadulterated word. But so much of it's all about prosperity and you and you and you prospering and you getting blessed and all this other junk. If we took all the money that we were spending on wasted television time and had 24 hours, seven days a week, nonstop preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and getting the gospel message of salvation out, we could, we could see millions and millions of people won. But you see unsaved people turn on the TV and there's that preacher, sow me a seed, sow me a seed. They turn it right off, they get turned off. And I think that has been the biggest trick of the enemy to get people turned off by, by seeing that on television, seeing ministers always asking for money. And so that's not what it's about. It has, that's, it's part of, you know, money is part of your worship. Your tithes and offerings, that's part of worship. And we understand that. We'll put it in its pr proper perspective. And so we need wisdom. We, we need wisdom on, on, on God. What, what do you want us to do about a building? If we're looking for a building, God, give us wisdom. Yeah, there can be buildings available, but we've got to ask God. God, is this the place you have for us? You know, you know what's going to happen down the road, how many people are going to be here, how to sustain the, the, the finances. God's all into that. If God wants us to have a building, he'll supply it, you know, and he'll, he's provided for us. And it's just amazing, because I talk to different people about different subjects and different things. And you'd be surprised, okay, like for missions, okay. I know a church that has at least three or 400 people in it, okay, and, and will raise, and raise for a missionary a thousand bucks, We have a little church here of 35, 40 people, okay? And we're pretty close to giving uh, Priscilla $3,000. <laughs> and we're going to Guatemala in, in June. And all the other things that we're doing. And I shake my head and I say, God, I don't know how you do it. And pay a $2,300 a month rent. And pay for the, the lights and pay, you know, the electricity, the heat that runs by electric. Pay the heat, heating bills. And pay the insurance. And the window washer that washes our windows. And all the other little telephone bills and all that other stuff. And we do all of that. And I say, my God, and here's the church of 300 and they can only raise $1,000? I mean, you, you all know how God can do anything. Amen. I mean, put it on my heart to raise that $3,000, and we had it in 10 minutes. People pledged. People said, I'll pledge this, I'll pledge that, pledge it. 10 minutes, we had it. It took about, what, 30 days before everybody gave their pledge? But guess what? We did it. And that's what I'm saying. It takes faith. It takes, it takes uh, the ability to trust God and to, and to understand him and to have wisdom to know what to do because we, we don't know. Okay. Any questions on the wisdom of God? None? Wow. We've exhausted the wisdom? <laughs> I'm sure we haven't exhausted the wisdom. I've got I to go very slowly in my Bible because the pages are falling out. Let me just say one thing about uh, worldly wisdom. There's a wisdom of this world, but James calls it devilish. Sometimes, sometimes what happens is we get clever within ourselves. We think it's our cleverness, and you know we think we can figure things out all along. No, that's not the way to do it. And so when we wait on God and we, we allow God to give us wisdom, he works it out somehow, which some way we can never figure out ourselves. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Next, I'm going to talk about the char characteristic of God and his infinitude. What is that? His infinite knowledge, his infinite being. God knows no boundaries. You often hear people say, don't put God in a box. How, what a stupid statement that is. Even in your thinking, you could never put God in a box. No way. 
I know what people mean by it, okay, but they're limiting God, and that's what they should say is don't limit God. But to put a concept of you're putting God in a box means that you're more powerful than the omniscient, all-powerful, all-ever-present God. If you could do that, <laughs> think about it, right? If you had the ability to put God in a box, you'd be greater than God. God has no boundaries. Now, this is very important when you read the Bible. If you don't have this in your spirit, get it there. God has no boundaries. So if he has no boundaries, that means what he did in the, in the Bible, he can still do today. Amen. He's not bound by time. His miracles are not bound by time. His acts are not bound by time. He's without boundary. That's why, you know, you could be home and God drops somebody in Africa on your heart, drop a name into you. Pray for Kula Buba. Who's Kula Buba? I don't know no Kula Buba. God say, pray for Kula Buba. Just pray. Don't sit there and try to reason it out and say, Oh, I mean, did I just make that up? God, God, you speaking to me? I don't want to be sounding foolish and praying for Kula Buba if there ain't no Kula Buba. Just pray. One day when you're in heaven, guess what? Kula Buba is going to come up to you. Say, you are the sister that prayed for me. The chief of the village, when I was preaching, was about to cut my head off. And something divinely stopped him. Don't take it for granted. God is not bound by boundaries. You can pray for somebody over in, on the other side of the world and they can get healed. You can pray for somebody on the other side of the world and they can get saved. You don't have to be there. Amen? Amen. Amen? You just understand God's character of who he is. He's not bound. He's not bound at all. He has no boundaries. What I mean by that is he, he, nothing can stop him if he wants to do something. He's not bound by anything. See, we put boundaries on God. You know how we do that? Oh, that's Old Testament. <laughs> oh, God can't move the way he did in the Old Testament and the way he did in the New Testament? He can't work it that way anymore? Sure he can. He can do whatever he wants to because he's God. Amen. Well, you know, God spoke through a donkey. Right? And I believe sometimes he, he does talk through donkeys or even now. They're just human donkeys. <laughs> you can put the two and two together. I won't say it. <laughs> All right? God can, God can do things. You say, well, God's not going to do anything he did in the Old Testament anymore. He's a New Testament God. Really? Didn't Elijah cast fire down from heaven? Read in Revelation about the, the false prophet. What's he going to do? Cast fire down from heaven. See, there's a false and there's a right. There's a right one and there's a false one. But see, don't say God is limited only by the New Testament now. He, he can't do any of those other things. Uh, excuse me. He came down on a mountain called Mount Sinai, right? He's coming down on Mount of Olives, isn't he? It's not too far off. Trust me. If that's the case, please rip, rip the Old Testament out of your Bible if you don't want to be bothered with it. Just rip it out. Just go by the New Testament. There's a movement also out there. They just believe the words of Paul. Because it was really him that was like, you know, the one with all the writings and all the books. So just throw away all the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all that stuff, and you don't need that. All you just need is Paul stuff. Stupid. Crazy. That's not wisdom. That's stupidity. His infitude. God knows no boundaries. He is without measure. This attribute, by definition, impacts all the others. Understand that. 
Since God is infinite, everything else about him must also be infinite also. Hmm. Talk about it for a moment. Ooh, that time went by so fast. Give me a break. The attribute of God in his sovereignty. Do you believe that God is sovereign? Oops. Do you really believe God is sovereign? Hmm. This is the attribute by which he rules his entire creation. Well, you say, yeah, but the devil usurped his authority and he's the God of this world by permission. Always understand that. Yes, Satan is the God of this world by permission. But not by ownership. Hello? The devil has stolen the right of dominion for man in the garden by listening to Satan. And he turned over that dominion to, to Satan willingly by sinning. That's why, that's why, if there's areas of your life that you turn over to sin, okay, the enemy will have dominion over you. That's why he has dominion. He can only have dominion over the kingdom that is allowed by permission. He can only usurp by permission. You know, remember Flip Wilson? Flip Wilson the devil made me do it. No, the devil can't make you do anything. That is the biggest lie. The devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. You somehow abdicated your authority over to the devil through your disobedience. So God is sovereign. Do you believe that? Can I tell you a story of, of God's sovereignty real quick? A friend of mine who was from Connecticut, we went to school with, Dave Bolton. He was on his way to church one day. Okay? And... Uh, his car broke down on interstate on, in Connecticut, right after the toll booth. He was on his way to church. Tried to get the car started. He was part of the worship team. He was going to be late. He said, God, I don't understand why this car won't start. You know, it just died. Just died. Trying to start the car. It won't start, won't start. So he's standing on the side of the road. The car pulls over. He said, young man, do you need any help? He said, well, he says, my car won't start. He said, I was on my way to church. He said, and um, I'm going to be late. I'm on the worship team. They said, well, come on, we'll take you. So he hopped in their car, got his guitar out, you know, got in the car and went to, went to church. And then they pulled in the parking lot. I said, geez, thank you very much. He said, would you like to come in? They said, yes. They went in. They both got saved. And at the time he told me that testimony, they had been in the church for over 10 years. Oh, you want to know what happened? When he went back to get his car, it started. True story. It's a true story. Okay. Is God sovereign in your life? If God is sovereign then you don't need to question why, why. When you look at the world and the end of the world and the president and all that other stuff, you go, why? Oh, if we only had this guy in the presidency, if we only had that guy in the presidency. Let me tell you something. God is sovereign. He's allowing the things that are happening in our government. He, I believe he's allowed President Obama to be president. People wanted Saul to be a king. What did God say? To Samuel, go ahead, anoint him. He had God's permission to put Saul in a position. That's what the people want. We're going to give them what they want. Go ahead. God does that for a reason. He's allowed it for a reason because he wants to teach America 
and show America where their true heart is. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the end times. God's sovereign. What does that mean? God's sovereign. What happened in the days of Noah? God told Noah, preach righteousness. Judgment's coming. Did they listen? No. What happened? Flood came. Judgment came. God's sovereign. He will deal with wickedness. And he's going to deal with wickedness. Now everybody's all panicking about the, the, the uh, blood moons coming. Oh, the blood moons are coming. Oh, oh, oh. So? God knows about the blood moons. But what's going to happen with the chip in the hand? Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, she'll explain it to you later. <laughs> but, you know, it's like we're getting all panicky. Don't look for the Antichrist, look for the Christ. You know, look for the rapture. Look for the, you know, don't be so, so shaken up that you're so worried about going to hell. You should be just thankful you're going to heaven. Make sure you're going to heaven. Amen. You get too focused sometimes. God's in control. Is he? Well, what about when a woman gets raped? Is that God's will? No. That's stupid. It's even a stupid question. Is it God's will to have a woman get raped? Huh. No. If God is real, how come he, he allows all the children all over the world to suffer and, and to go hungry? Hmm. Good question, right? One time somebody posed that question toward me. If God really is God, then how come he allows the children to suffer and go hungry? Give me an answer. So I do what I always try to do. I bow my head and said, Holy Ghost, what can I answer? I said, you want me to answer you? He said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll give you an answer. You say, why does God allow it? I say, why does man allow it? Why are you putting on God what man can do in their own strength? We have the ability to wipe it out. Oh, no, but you know what we'll do? We'll spend like $1.5 billion on a Super Bowl or a stupid game and traffic women's bodies and make all kinds of millions and millions of dollars. But guess what? We won't feed the, we won't feed the poor all over the world. We'll go out and, and buy 80 pairs of shoes or 100 pairs of shoes and all kinds of clothes and all kinds of trying to keep up with the Joneses and getting better houses and all kinds of better stuff when we could take some of that profit of that money instead of spending it stupidly on ourselves on all the stuff that's going to burn and give it to missions and give it to people that can go out and do the work of God and feed the hungry oh I can't afford to give I can't afford to give I just spent fifty thousand dollars on my new bathroom think about it what do you do in a bathroom Like it's a palace. You know? Hey, everybody, come in and see my bathroom. <laughs> see? A bathroom toilet facility has cable TV. It has a built in refrigerator. Built in back massage while you're sitting down. Yeah, for what? What do you do there? Hello? But you see what I'm saying? God is sovereign. God's power. He, nothing takes him by surprise. Don't, don't think God is surprised by what's happening. What's going to happen is going to get worse. This, I've been listening to economists that have been saying that they predicted in 2007, 2008, the, the collapse of Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac, or whatever the name of those things, I don't remember. Okay, 
They, he put, he put his, his uh, financial agency predicted all, G, the fall of GM, all of that stuff, because he looked over their financial records and said, it's just a matter of time. It's common sense. And sure enough, and he's saying, by the end of this year, America is going to have such a total collapse economically that's going to change our way of living. We're not going 401Ks, say goodbye. Wave bye-bye. Everybody's putting their money in gold and silver. I know, I'll be a smile, I'll be smarter. I'll put gold, you know, gold and silver, I'll buy gold, silver, platinum, and all that stuff. You know what the Bible says? I read it one time, I couldn't believe it. It says, in the day of vanity, in the day of, of wrath, your gold or silver will not deliver you. So all these people are going out and buying all this gold and silver. It's not going to deliver them. If God has to, he can feed me through a raven. Hallelujah. God is sovereign. It is the application of this other attributes of being all-knowing, all-powerful. It makes him absolutely free to do what he knows to be best. Hmm. God is in control of everything that happens. Man still has a free will and is responsible for his choices in life. You're, you are responsible. You can't say, well, if God is sovereign, then he, he, he did this. No. No, he allowed it. That's why the Bible says that when we do something wrong, we can always go to him. He's made, an, he's made a way of escape to go and repent and get right with God. So we talked about wisdom, his infitude, his sovereignty. Now we're going to talk about one more thing and then we'll close. I have several more, but his holiness. If you have a misconception of God's holiness, you will live a misconcepted life. You will not, you will, you will, you will do things and think things. You know there's some Christians, I'm talking Christians, that have no, no, Nothing bothers them to lie. They'll lie like a rug. They know they're lying to you when you talk to them. Okay? And sometimes you know that they're lying. Okay? But they'll lie, and then if you catch them in the lie, they cover it up by trying to explain, and they'll, they'll go around in circles creating another lie. Hello? And it doesn't bother them. Or they think this way. Well, I'll lie now, and then I'll ask God to forgive me later, and he'll forgive me. Think about it. When people lie, the source of that lie comes from the, from the devil. He's the father of lies. He's the progenitor. He's the one that creates the lies. Think about it. He's the one that creates a lie. So if you speak a lie, you're speaking the nature of Satan. You're speaking what Satan wants you to do. Instead of speaking the truth, you're speaking a lie. That's kind of, shouldn't have said that around tax time, huh? Mm -hmm. God's holiness. How you conduct yourself. How you... Live what you say, what you think, what you do. And we're all guilty. Is because a lot of times we don't hold a regenerated mind, a regenerated life, like I've been speaking on Sundays, about regeneration versus reformation. Some, many of us are reformed. We don't do some of the things we don't do, but we've never been regenerated. And we need to be regenerated in thinking, wait a minute, God, you're holy. Is this pleasing to you? It, and how, what, I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, is this, is this, is, is this a right represent, rep representation of who you are? Because it's one thing to be reverencing God here in the temple, but are you reverencing God in this temple? God is holy. That's who he is. God is holy. This is the attribute that sets God apart from all other created beings. It refers to his majesty and his perfect moral purity. 
There is absolutely no sin or evil thought in God at all. His holiness is the definition of that which is pure and righteous in the entire universe. Wherever God has appeared, such as to Moses at the burning bush, that, be that place becomes holy just for God having been there. Just because God was there. So when we pray, uh, when we come into church, you walk through the doors, and you're distracted. You haven't seen your brothers and sisters for a while, so you get distracted. You start talking. Start talking about worldly things, what's going on, what you're having for dinner, where you went, where you went last Thursday, what movie you went and saw. And you begin to speak about these things, and then you come in, and then all of a sudden, the music starts, and a little switch goes. Holiness. No. And that's why God's not in a lot of assemblies. We cannot approach a holy God in an unholy manner. We cannot approach a holy God in an unholy manner. We cannot approach a holy God in a disrespectful manner. If we're together and we're, we've come into this place, and that's why I want to encourage you, when you come in on Sunday morning, try to come a few minutes early. I know it's hard sometimes because you're always rushing. Everybody's rushing around. Everybody's late. Everybody's doing something, right? But if you can come on time, come to the altar and just prepare your heart to receive all that God has for you for that day and say, God, I'm here for you. I'm not here so much to get something. I'm here to give something. Begin to ask the Lord for your gift. God, let my gift come forward. Let me be a blessing to the body of Christ. You know, very shortly, I've been talking about this, but we've kind of delayed it, but we need to start doing this. I want to form an altar ministry. I want those who are, who are really serious with God, that have a walk with God, that can pray with people. I don't want to be the only one praying for people up here on Sunday morning. It's not about me. That's why sometimes I call you, call you up to come pray for people. Because God can give you a word. God can speak to you. It's a body ministry. I'm not the head. Christ is the head. I'm part of the body just like you. I just have a little accountability and more uh, of responsibility, but I'm like you. And God wants to use you. God wants to equip you. God wants to give you the ability to go and lay hands on somebody and they get healed. Or give them a word and see, see that word touch their hearts and change their lives. God wants to use you. And we want to do that. But if you want to, how many would really like to see, I mean, I've heard testimonies of the glory of God hitting places, you know, where it was so powerful that, you know, people were just astounded because the glory of, the God, of God had fallen in a place. And I had spoken about that the other day when I gave the testimony about Arthur Lee in, in, in Africa with the hut and the, the glory of God, the blue Shekinah came over that hut and people outside were getting saved and people were getting healed and, and God's presence was in that place. We can have that. Let me, let me just say this in closing. Okay. The amount of the presence of God in any place is not on the choice of music, it's not on the ability of the professional singers. It has nothing to do with that. People have made it that, and they've mistaken prof professionalism for the anointing. I know the difference. I've been, in the world for th I've been in the world a long time, and I was in the world in the nightclub business. I played an instrument in the nightclub business, and I can tell you even today, there's Christian music that is so ungodly, it's unbelievable. And I can tell you, it's none of those things that bring the presence of God. How many here, I'm going to take a, a little survey, how many here would really love to have an overwhelming outward manifestation of the presence of God in this church? Mostly everybody, okay? You know how that's going to happen? The increase of that will happen when it increases in you. Because God doesn't dwell with temples made with hands. Hello? 
to the degree you bring him in to your temple, to the degree that you acknowledge him. That's why in worship, it shouldn't be a struggle in worship. We shouldn't have to stop and bind devils and all kinds of things. You know, and when, when there's an oppressive spirit and a heaviness here, we shouldn't have to do that. Every single one of you should be doing that before you come in. Every single one of you that are sitting there, instead of talking about what's going on in the world and what's going on, the, and what's going on on Facebook and all this other stuff, if you would just take the time to just begin to bind the spirits that would distract you from worshiping God. Bind the spirits of heaviness that would try to stop you from opening your mouth and praising God. Because he wants to rob. He's, he wants to steal. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill your spirituality. He wants to rob your spirituality. And how we avoid that is by coming in prepared and saying, Lord, I'm here for one, one purpose only. I'm not here for Pastor Bob. I'm here for you. I'm here to worship you. I'm here to worship you. I'm here to give my time to you. And that's why you should turn off your cell phones. Give God a couple of hours of your time without interruption. Because really and truly, you and I are not that important. And anything that is important can wait. Because guess what? If you dropped your phone in the toilet and it didn't work anymore, you'd still come to church, I hope. Okay? But if we come with that expectation of the manifest presence of God in our lives, you begin to cultivate that in your personal walk with God at home. and You bring that personal cultivated life into the assembly. I'm telling you, as I'm standing here right now, the power and the presence of God will fill this place like never before. And I'll tell you, I've read stories of revival. I've read stories of churches that have begun a move of God. You didn't, they didn't have to advertise. People were drawn here. People were drawn to the church. And they came in and said, I don't understand, but God told me to come here. I, I, ju I just sense his presence as I was walking in the parking lot. You know, people, people in, the, in churches that I've read in, in, in revivals were just falling down in the parking lot. Families, kids, children, everybody was falling down in the parking lot, just worshiping God and crying and just reaching out to God and feeling God's presence. We can have that today. Yes, sin is abounding. Yes, terrible things are happening. But it doesn't have to, have to happen inside the church. God is sovereign and God is holy and he wants to manifest himself. Jesus said, if you come and you obey me, I will manifest, I will obey me, I will manifest myself to you. He will openly show himself. So this Sunday, let's do an experiment. The rest of this week, I want you to take five minutes of your time just to sit and listen to some instrumental Christian music without words and just pour your heart out to God and worship. And do it, do it tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday morning when you come in, just drop your stuff off quietly. Come in a couple minutes if you can early. I know it's hard sometimes. And just come up to the altar. Or when we're worshiping God, just come up to the altar. And just pour your heart out to God and say, God, I'm here with no reservations. I'm here with no reserves. I'm here to totally abandon myself in you today. Speak to me. You know what I have need of. You know all my needs, God. I'm not here to, to make a complaint department to you on Sunday morning. I can, do that at, I can do it at home. I'm not here to ask for things. Okay? I'm here for you to pour out your spirit upon me. I need you, Jesus. You start developing and cultivating that kind of a need for God, you will see the manifest presence in this place. Because it's not up to me. It's not up to the music we choose. It's not up to any of those things. It's not, it's not, it's not up to instrumentalists. That has nothing to do with it. The anointing of God will be upon you and be upon this church in the desire and the level that you want him to. So if you want him to be here in a, in a greater measure, okay, you have to desire it. And you have to be willing and obedient. Hello? Be obedient to his voice when he speaks to you. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Sister Annie, come and close in prayer, will you? We'll touch on the other attributes next week.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for this word, Lord. I pray that it will take root in us and bring forth good fruit. Lord, that we will desire more of you, that we will seek you for wisdom and knowledge with understanding, that we will acknowledge your holiness, Lord God, and it will be manifest in our lives, that you will draw others unto you, Lord, and add to the church daily such as should be saved. Father, I ask for your mercy upon us as we go our separate ways, that we will walk in your love. I ask for your protection and your provision, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.